I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINNetwork.com. Welcome to the RAIN Insights Podcast from RAIN Network. In this podcast episode, David Lawrence, co-founder of RAIN, speaks with Dr. Mark Gold about the relationship between addiction and enterprise risk. Dr. Gold is an author, inventor, and mentor who has had over a thousand peer-reviewed publications since the beginning of his academic career at the University of Florida College of Medicine and Yale University School of Medicine in the 1970s. He is best known for developing the pioneering translational laboratory to human research methods of discovery for addiction and psychiatry. He has over 30,000 academic research citations and an H index of 93. He has made impactful contributions to psychiatry, neuroendocrinology, radiation oncology, transplant biology, orthopedic surgery, public health, pain, obesity medicine, and substance use disorders. Gold was a founding member of the McKnight Brain Institute and ultimately became one of its directors. Mark, this is a, uh, a very, very special treat to and I want to thank you in advance for lending your perspective and your support. Uh, this is the inaugural podcast of United States of Addiction. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't provide some context. Uh, I won't reveal how old we are respectively, except we both have had significant birthdays of late. And uh, we've been around the block, but I was a young prosecutor in the Southern District of New York at the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and I was part of the narcotics unit, and I still remember uh, decades and decades ago the um, session and the introduction I had to you when you came in to speak to uh, a small group of prosecutors about a an issue you were seeing on the horizon, and you came to educate us and to warn us and to advise us about uh, something called crack cocaine. And uh, so, again, many years later, and obviously we've done things together, but it's great to reconnect and actually have the technology and the ability to maybe scale some of your great insights and perspectives and writings to a broader audience because you truly are a very, very important asset to this country. And hopefully we can share um, the knowledge, wisdom, and insights that uh, people need to understand this and to manage it and to deal with it in their own personal lives. Uh, a subtitle, as you and I discussed uh, for the podcast, is One Degree of Separation, because at this point in society, everybody has either been impacted directly by the issue of substance use disorder, addiction, or they know someone that, that has been. So uh, with that somewhat long-winded introduction, Mark. Thank you again, and welcome. Yeah, thank you, David. It's a, a privilege, and as you know, um, my work as a researcher doesn't mean very much if I can't explain it to people, and if I can't make it useful when it is useful. And sometimes I do work that is useful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I will say, and without gilding the lily too much, Mark, um, and this is for our audience. Uh, Mark had a wonderful, wonderful series um, of um, about insights into evolving medical research, which was entitled, if I remember correctly, Mark, Research You Can Use. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're going to build on that as well. Um, I think it, just by way of a personal narrative, Mark, if you can take us through your career a bit. I think that will be helpful for the audience and just obviously um, how as a one of the nation's leading psychiatrists, uh, your work in the area of addiction, substance use disorder has evolved and the different roles that you've had. Sure. I'll um, try to uh, cut it down as much as logical and still make some sense out of it. Anytime you've been doing something since 1971, continuously, um, there's a lot that you could say. And so one high-level way of describing what I do is I've uh, worked 
in the science of addiction and neuroscience continuously since that time. I've taught neuroanatomy in medical school for 40 years at one time continuously. And I've done research um, trying to explain how the brain works and how drugs might be used to help us understand pleasure. So most people um, who are in the field have a, a big lived uh, experience component. And for me, that's not the case. I started as a, a basic researcher. I was looking at a memory and pleasure. And as it turned out, I uh, was advised by mentors at that time to use amphetamine as a, a probe because people were using amphetamine to study. And actually, there was very little data on did amphetamine improve your memory? Did amphetamine, uh, what did it do in the brain and so forth? So um, I studied what uh, amphetamine and memory in, in animals and, and showed something that uh, is a, a consistent finding among researchers for the last 50 years. And that is, if you learn something in a certain chemical state, let's say straight, not on drugs, and you're asked to recall it straight, not on drugs, you have maximum recall. Uh, if you learn something in the amphetamine state and are asked to remember it in the amphetamine state, an identical amphetamine state, you have near maximum or maximum recall. So you're really the same as learning it in the straight, um, non-drug state, non-drug state. However, if you learn something in the amphetamine state, and are tested or quizzed or you have, you have the misfortune of having to take a test in a different uh, amphetamine state, there's a mismatch and you really don't remember as well. And so you see people trying to remember, they hit themselves or try to stimulate themselves to get back to this chemical state again. Anyway, that was called state dependency of memory and is, I had a series of, of studies on, on that. And, um, you know, even today that's used, um, in OB training to help medical students and residents understand why women remember childbirth so well, but only when they're in it again, because the chemical states align and you have maximum recall. If you didn't have state dependency of memory, maybe no one would have a second child because it's so painful and arduous. So um, I started there and then um, kind of moved on to think about what amphetamine did in the brain and it worked on dopamine and norepinephrine. And I spent really maybe the next 20, 25 years studying both of those neurotransmitters. So I studied norepinephrine and moved from Florida to Yale where I had the chance to work in basic science labs with um, George Egegenian at Yale University and then in non-human primate and human research, um, studying um, noradrenergic systems and um, ended up by 77, 78, um, figuring out where in the brain opioids acted, how the brain changed with chronic opioid administration what was the panic button in the brain during opioid withdrawal that caused all the great distress? And then how you might reverse it with an opioid or might reverse it with a non-opioid. And that led to the invention of clonidine or lofexidine, alpha adrenergic medications that could eliminate withdrawal. So that kind of made me uh, an addiction expert it's in 1970s, even though I still thought of myself as a pleasure researcher because I was continuously interested in dopamine. And I kind of then moved in, what do you do when you detox a person? And that got me to naloxone and naltrexone and MATs, medically assisted treatments. And 
um, at Yale, Herb Kleber, a mentor of mine, um, offered me the, the chance to run the medication assisted treatment program at Yale that um, he was the director of. And that meant I had firsthand experience with naloxone in the Yale emergency room, reversing overdoses, uh, naltrexone was an experimental treatment to prevent relapses and methadone. We had a large methadone program at that, at that time. So I worked from uh, the laboratory to humans, and um, I think that's the core experience that set me up with lots of ideas and lots of questions, and I've tried to answer them as I could as the technology allowed over the rest of my life. So it's a great overview. I want to actually just lead the witness a little bit, Mark, because um, you have also operated with great intellectual honesty in a variety of arenas, advising mm -hmm. policy makers on the federal state level, law enforcement agencies, the White House, drug czars, uh, et cetera. And um, I think it would be fair, but I want you to correct me uh, if I'm wrong, that you have, from the very beginning of your, your journey, as a physician, you've looked at this as a medical issue. Oh, yeah, no doubt. The, um, the whole Yale program was based on the idea that blaming the patient was a failed strategy. Um, white knuckling was a failed strategy and it was up to us to develop treatments to reverse overdose. And keep in mind, we gave naloxone in the emergency room in the early 70s at a time when maybe in the whole United States there were 1,300 or 1,500 overdose deaths. This is really an orphan drug. And then we had a methadone program at that time with hundreds of people in New Haven and storefront clinics around the city of New Haven. And then we were testing new treatments for people who either didn't want to be on an opioid maintenance treatment program or didn't want to go to a methadone program because of the, the kinds of governmental regulations associated with it. We also treated comorbidities at that time. We had a central medical facility so that we could provide primary care to people with substance use disorders and their families. We had uh, dentists come, we treated uh, serious illnesses and comorbid psychiatric illness. But I think it's fair also to point out at that time when um, we did have a, a substance use disorder patient come into the emergency department, we did not have the ability to either admit them to Yale New Haven Hospital or to send them to a treatment program within the Department of Psychiatry so that we were treating people in the community in storefronts, um, in church-sponsored programs, and in um, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous church basement programs because that was really what was available to us. And the reason I bring this up, because I want to level set the conversations we will be having over a series of podcasts, because too often um, the issue of substance use, substance abuse, addiction, is viewed through uh, a moral lens, a legal lens, uh, a matter of uh, what I'll refer to shame and blame and et cetera. And you have always attempted in an honest way uh, to attempt to understand the issue in medical terms and to understand how the brain works and to understand what I'll refer to as approaches and solutions and research findings that actually could be used and could be helpful in addressing this. And this country has gone through a, a wide cycle of responses and you know we're going to be reviewing some of that from the days of uh, Nancy Reagan and just say no to the imposed you know harsher penalties for 
certain forms of drugs, etc. But Mark, uh, I think it's fair to say, and I want people to, to hear this, this is not a, um, a an issue where you're either hard or soft on the uh, on the question. This is your your professional career, if I could sum it up, has always been focused on what does the science tell us, what does data tell us, what does experience tell us, and to understand this as an issue involving sort of medicine. It's a medical issue, it's a disease issue, it's an issue involving the human brain. And that's how we have to approach it. I mean, that, that's been my career. That's why um, when I describe my career, I say I'm a translational neuroscientist. Many times in my career, I've been um, in the awkward position of saying that something was a disease of the brain or a disease and um, being 20 years ahead of definitive data. I'm probably, I'm thinking about my work in the 80s, looking at sugar and, and highly processed foods and um, with Bart Hubble and Nicole Lavina, um, thinking about how food might also be addicting and how uh, blaming people for overeating and obesity um, is a failed strategy. So we, we have, um, we can talk about all of these kinds of things because they'll come down to the notion that the brain has within it what we call phylogenetically stable, meaning from rats to non-human primates to humans, the core pleasure system of the brain is the same. That's really sad to consider uh, be, uh, oftentimes, but we do have the ability to learn how to control that. But most of that learning takes place in um, adolescence or early, you know, through the early 20s, so that we do have the ability to develop inhibitory control of this system so that we're not just like uh, 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 rodents or, or non-human primates, but that takes a lot of work to develop that system. Um, the system itself can dominate a person's daily thoughts, can be intrusive, can demand attention, and demand the fulfillment of a drive, which is an acquired drive, and we mostly understood this, part of the reason I got involved with food, we mostly understood this as the, the drugs of abuse um, hijacking the brain's reward system. And that is a, a survival related reward system that rewards us primarily for eating. And that's also why drugs of abuse and eating kind of work like a seesaw if drugs are on, eating's off, and if eating is on, drugs are off. Um, and we can go through that for every drug. But, but um, it's, uh, these are acquired, almost like drive states, like the drive to uh, uh, drink water or to eat or to procreate, all of these things you're, we're born with, but um, drugs of abuse becomes a drive like those other drives, can overtake them and then make survival, um, it compromises our ability to think about survival. So in, in many ways, you know, think about your own career or, or what you enjoy doing in your life. And when you speak to people who have a substance use disorder, they'll often say, you know, I used to sing in the church choir. But then it wasn't as reinforcing as I needed it to be. I used to be a little league manager. I used to be a good father. I used to go to work on time. I used to do a good day's work. I used to be a good husband. I used to be a good citizen. All the, whatever it is over time, drugs of abuse, they dominate the person's uh, daily life and being 
so that this this um, almost in a state dependent sense there's like another person there and we could get into discussions of free will and um, it, it it's too complicated and I'm not a lawyer that's a discussion for you to have but um, it is really true that drugs of abuse certain drugs of abuse in animals are self-administered um, and can be self-administered to death other drugs not so much but um, still we're the the uh, brain's pleasure system can be accessed by drugs the drugs have evolved over time to be more and more specific for these receptors that access that's the closest to the end game are the most dangerous and the most reinforcing and now today we have behavioral addictions which are technology boosted um, behaviors that um, can dominate as well and that could include sports gambling it could include uh, social media it could include pornography all of which existed before but not in their um, energized current technology enhanced states yeah. so what is and hence the topic United States of addiction and um, we are definitely going to be getting into the issue of free will or the lack thereof. Uh, Mark, I want to bring you back a little bit um, in terms of history because of what you have <coughs> said. Um, I, I still remember, and hopefully um, we can pull this up and maybe we'll attach it to the podcast, but the popular anti-drug messaging uh, back in the 80s was, uh, this is your brain. Uh -huh. This is your brain on drugs, and you'd see a, an egg frying in a pan. And what I hear you saying is, no, that's that's not actually how how it is. Okay, that is uh, that is not how this happens. And maybe the end result is your brain gets fried. But the issue of how the brain works and how the brain, you know, rewards itself and the 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 things that can happen to take over uh, an individual's behavior and approach and priorities is a very, very different process. And if you want to look at the longest war, I think I, I, I read an article a while ago, Mark, I'll have to dig it up, but this is, this is actually the longest war that the United States has ever battled, the war, the war on drugs. And um, the strategies, I'm not sure, have fully incorporated, you know, some of the insights that you will be sharing with us and some of the things you've touched upon already in terms of understanding this as a medical issue, a brain issue, and why certain policies are, are destined to fail. Uh, and if I can put even more history on this, I still remember enough of Greek mythology and um, the tales of Ulysses and the land of the lotus eaters and the loss of free will when the ship landed and you know, certain lotus leaves were imbibed. You know, um, this is going to be, that's the most complicated. So it's very, it's a, um, the, the whole idea of prevention. What is prevention? Can education be prevention? Can you educate um, people to not use drugs in an environment that we're in today? The environment in the, 60s or 70s is so different than today it's um you know I, it's hard to draw inferences and and to criticize but i will say this that one of the national institute of drug abuse experts um, jean Luc cadet who works in methamphetamine um, i've done a little work with him myself has done pioneering work to show that uh, methamphetamine is not very forgiving as a drug and that it does actually cause changes like you would get in a concussion. And worse still, methamphetamine raises body temperature like cocaine, like cocaine overdose, which we don't have a treatment for, by the way, or methamphetamine overdose, 
which we don't have a treatment for. We don't have naloxone or nalmaphene for either of those uh, overdoses. It causes your body temperature to go up. And actually the treatment in an emergency room, and our treatment at Yale um, was uh, to pack the people in ice to try to bring their temperature down mm -hmm. so they didn't um, have hyperthermic related uh, brain cell damage. So it's, it's, a, um, uh, it's not the place in the drug crisis or the user um, history that you want to make an intervention. You want to make an intervention earlier than that, way before, God forbid, something like this happens and there's a loss of function. All right. And look, I started um, in the introduction to talk about your coming into the U.S. Attorney's Office and speaking to us about uh, something that we had not yet seen, but that was coming, crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And you've already alluded to um, what has occurred, you know, in your now 45 plus years of experience, which is the acceleration of technology. And that you alluded to social media algorithms and sort of, you know, the fact that many of these platforms actually do understand how the brain works and they... Yeah. Reward. It's an interesting thing. One side of the equation understands how the brain works, and they're they're monetizing and capitalizing on it. But from a policy standpoint, the um, on the regulatory and control side, we're we're still playing catch up. Um, but you recently have written a very interesting article and um, about something that is already emerging. Uh, with fentanyl, and obviously fentanyl is, in, you know, in some ways a, uh, I would argue, is a disruptive technology because of the ability to produce it, to produce it cheaply, the low barriers of entry for people who are manufacturing, the plentiful sources of supply, and obviously the impunity um, with which many of the people who are involved in the manufacture and distribution of it. Um, are able to operate. Uh, but maybe um, we're going to fast forward to the future and I'm going to ask you what are you seeing on the fentanyl front that people need to be aware of in terms of uh, its use and I'll, I'll call it its availability. Um. So, you know, I think the, um, the major uh, changes in the drug epidemic, we started with a prescription opioid epidemic. Um, most people um, understand that too many uh, opioid prescriptions were written, like OxyContin, for uh, people who complained of pain, and that drug experience changed their brain and change their behavior and caused them to uh, like it, uh, self-administer it, ask for more, and have terrible consequences as a result. O over uh, time, when that was recognized, the pill mills were closed up, the doctor prescribers were identified, and efforts were made to rein that in. The people were still out there and they turned to heroin. Um, heroin um, is uh, trans-shipped in bulk, as you know. The DEA does a pretty good job of trying to find it and find it. Um, however, as, the, the, as heroin took over for OxyContin and prescription opioids, it was quickly replaced by fentanyl that could be made in a lab and could be sent in the U.S. mail and bypass most um, enforcement control. Um, so over as right now, if you try to buy heroin, for the most part, you're going to get fentanyl anyway. Um, it used to be we thought of fentanyl as a contaminant, but no, it's really replaced heroin because it's a hundred times more potent and the volume is very uh, insignificant. It's easy to send 
and people do literally just send it in the mail. Um, the number of overdose deaths due to fentanyl increased over time again, and now I'd say 80% of the overdose deaths are due to fentanyl. Even the methamphetamine and cocaine deaths that have been rising are due to fentanyl. And fentanyl is, a, is put as, as a kind of Trojan horse in um, counterfeit pills as well. So there's small amounts of fentanyl in counterfeit pills, but the, when you say small for fentanyl, um, I think, I'll forget the exact number, but I'd say it's 0.007% is a lethal dose for most people of fentanyl. So you've heard people say it's smaller than a top of a pin, or it, you're not going to detect it very often. You know, fentanyl overdoses um, took off. They continue to take off. And the newest trend, which isn't really so new because we used to have patients who would uh, heat up fentanyl patches and um, inhale the resultant vapors, is uh, currently there's um, a great deal of fentanyl smoking. So fentanyl smoking... Um, started pretty much in San Francisco, um, oftentimes was associated with overdoses because of a couple of factors. One, the users tended to be people who were naive um, to opioids, naive to fentanyl, and they thought that it would be safer for them than injecting fentanyl, which is a brings me back to what you were saying before about crack cocaine, was that people didn't realize that crack cocaine was a virtual equivalent of injecting cocaine hydrochloride intravenously. That smoking is de facto injection of the drug without a needle. So the only advantage that you might have from smoking is you know, hepatitis or HIV risks. However, in the smoked situation, people do have sores and cuts in their mouth. And now we see people who are smoking other people's fentanyl with other people's pipes, smoking their fentanyl. They put their fentanyl in. There's, there's residue from the previous smoker. And so they either get too much dose, an overdose, or sometimes they just put fentanyl in, in pipes and other apparatus where they smoke uh, methamphetamine, and so that's the modern speedball. So we're the 70s and the Saturday Night Live people popularized the speedball as intravenous heroin plus cocaine, um, similar to what Freud had prescribed to detox morphine addicts, adding cocaine to it. Um, nowadays, it's all synthetics it's all manufactured drugs, and so the speedball is fentanyl plus methamphetamine. Um, highly dangerous, prone to overdose, and if you don't overdose, the methamphetamine, as I said from Jean-Luc Cadet's research, does not leave the brain in the same state that the brain was in before it was exposed to methamphetamine. So it's a challenging um, place that we're in right now as far as drugs of abuse are concerned. Okay. And, um, Mark, I do remember um, the conversation we've had um, that all these issues are actually, um, they're, they're a multiplicity of questions that involve um, sort of understanding, and, and I'll, I'll use the word, the empathy that has to be applied here, uh, but there's a role for law enforcement. Um, this is a geopolitical concern because of the multitude of sources of supply and where drugs come in. Um, it is a slippery slope. Very often, you know, decisions are made that, uh, without fully understanding the consequences, and often by young people who are 
innately inclined to take risks. Um, you've spoken in the past about co-occurring conditions or people who are suffering from anxiety and depression and they sometimes turn to self-medication and then they feel better and again it's a, a slippery slope from there. And then the types of you know treatments medically, psychologically, um, that have shown to be more effective than others. And in the upcoming podcast, we're going to be going into all of these. Uh, we also sent around to the network a brilliant article, which you wrote about the role of um, exercise and nutrition in uh, addressing substance use disorder. And I want to get into that in coming podcasts. Um, but as you were talking about, you know, basically fentanyl and, and, and I'll call it how little is needed for it to be a lethal dose. Um, there was a story recently that made the headlines, and in some respects it's the same old story, but still it's a, it's a recent revelation uh, about a talented young woman um, who actually I think she was pre-med uh, at a university in uh, New York uh, who thought she was taking a Percocet with a, one of her college friends at a party, it turned out to be fentanyl, and she died. And um, I want to sort of delve in in future podcasts with you, you know, what, what is the role of institutions in staying informed and informing whether they're students at a university, employees at a business, you know, government agencies and their folks, this is, again, um, sort of a uh, recurring issue, epidemic, that, um, you know, takes no prisoners and, you know, knows no boundaries. It's one degree of separation at most. And we'll be getting into all of that um, with you in coming podcasts. But I wanted to basically... Um, well, that's a terrible story. Yes, you know the story then. Yeah. yeah, I do, and <clears throat> you know, I just couldn't. Um, it, it's a uh, the the field like of um, suicide prevention, where you've always also worked, and where I had an interest to. Um, there's been a good deal of study on the second and third hand effect on the family and survivors, and there has been insufficient study and support for the survivors of uh, accidental overdoses. Right. And you can imagine how difficult it must be. Um, I also, you know, uh, in, in one of my recent articles, I, I said probably the best prevention campaign in modern days is the DEA's One Pill Can Kill because if that message would have gotten to this pre-medical student, she would have realized that bootlegged, non-prescription pills, one pill can kill. Um, sharing somebody else's prescriptions um, is never a good idea, but today is especially dangerous. And I just bring this up because it struck me when you think about um, behavioral addictions or social media. Just imagine if a social media company was giving people counterfeit pills that were killing them. Like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's unbelievable to think that someone would kill their customers even. Um, and that if you just added up the overdose deaths I, I had this statistic for one of my uh, articles. If you just took, since 2000, it's one million people, one million overdose deaths. You're like, how could that be? Um, and uh, it's a, it must be that we're not capable of learning lessons from people who have tragic outcomes. And instead, we think that we're smarter than they are, or they made a mistake in their use pattern, or 
whatever their experience is, it doesn't relate to me. So that the prevention message um, in these million deaths have been lost on people um, and on our culture. Um, and as you said, it's not even an issue in um, daily uh, interactions. And we're not even seeing this in the uh, coming up, at least in the polling, around the upcoming presidential campaign. Other issues seem to have gone forward, yet this is has been an existential risk uh, for this country. And I'll just comment, you know, the one pill that ki- one pill can kill, uh, but the so the uh, I'll call it the ancillary message mark is that the pill you think you're taking is not the pill you actually are taking, and that's. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think right. you know we we've gotten used to um, this kind of shadow marketplace. We have illegal marijuana shops, and we have right. um, instant uh, drug delivery at our doorstep. But um, there used to be such a thing as a pharmacist and drug stores, and we have always relied, and we are protected by the FDA. Um, we're protected by the DEA, and those protections have somehow been lost in the um, uh, e-commerce era. Right. And just because uh, I'm, I'm going to lead the witness again, but um, I'll share with the audience that the um, the deaths and destruction that have been caused and the statistics that Mark uh, has pointed to um, don't necessarily tell the full scope of the story because Mark has dealt with um, leading members of the law enforcement community who have lost their children uh, to overdoses and have lost their children to addiction. And so this is really not, uh, it's not an educational exercise anymore. Uh, there's something else, and we have to start applying the lessons that we've acquired over now multiple, multiple well, I mean, decades. You know, yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly add on to that because I, I do have a, um, a sizable piece of my career was helping and then studying impaired health professionals, uh, physicians who became... Uh, uh, substance use disordered and who needed intervention and treatment and it to me whether it's a law enforcement official or someone who can read and understand the the kind of um, education for prevention is limited so that what they however odd it is and it doesn't fit in the current time when we're very experiential, and uh, we don't believe that uh, harm will come to us. Um, it is really true that if you don't use, you can't be addicted. So one of the funny um, things that was followed up in the genetics of alcohol use disorder was that it appeared that alcohol use disorder skipped a generation, so that if you're father had an alcohol use disorder, the children tended to not have one. And oftentimes were non-drinkers completely. Uh, but it wasn't genetic. It turned out that they were, the experience was so horrific that they didn't drink. So that the genetic vulnerabilities that they had were never exposed. And I do think we should, we'll spend some time maybe um, discuss some of the genetic findings, but there are really good genetic researchers using twins um, brought up in separate households and other methods that have helped us understand risks. So there's risks in your genes, there's risks in your psychiatric diagnoses, there's risks if you break a bone and need opioids, There are risks if you're exposed in utero. There are risks if, as we studied in Afghanistan, my group studied second and third hand opium smoke exposure, 
where the dad smoked opium and the children and wife were exposed. These are, so there's a multiplicity of risks, but the bottom line is that drugs of abuse have been modified to make them more reinforcing and the more attractive, stimulating and reinforcing they are, the less capable we are of saying no to them. Mark, I want to thank you for your time today and um, obviously some of the great articles you're pushing out through psychology today, but also the continued research and, and your collaboration with great people around the country. Um, so look forward, this is an introductory podcast, look forward to delving into the issues, including the one you just referenced in terms of genetic disposition and, and the impact of the environment and in, in driving this. Um, also want to get into the co-occurring issues of depression and anxiety and what people really have to know and begin to understand and, and you know, um, basically this is an issue of broad societal concern, policy concern, but it is also uh, all, I was going to say, when it comes to this issue, Mark, all politics are local. So at the school level, community level, and of course on the family level. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to scheduling our next podcast, uh, which hopefully we can knock out a, a, a couple every month. Um, and obviously we'll link it to some of the great articles that you're writing. Well, it's my pleasure, and I'm happy to help. And I really appreciate you focusing on this because um, it's, we really don't focus on it enough. Um, if you think about the total number of people who are expected to die this year of just overdose alone, that's well over 100,000. The number of people who will need emergency room treatment. Um, addiction medicine, you know, when I started, wasn't even a field. So the idea that we, that this is the nation's number one unmet public health crisis just seems unbelievable to me after uh, work, my work. But it is where it is, and without you getting the word out, we won't get it out. Okay, and uh, until we, you know, until this, put, put a date in this calendar, until this point, uh, no end in sight, but Mark, we're going to try to leverage and scale uh, the body of your significant work over the last, you know, 40 plus years. So again, thanks for your time and look forward to our next uh, podcast. Thank you. This is the Rain Insights podcast, which is part of the Rain Insights series comprised of both virtual and real world events offering unique practical perspectives from Rain's leading experts in risk management. To learn more, please visit us at rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. Thank you for listening.